Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Morconan. I'm Brett Ewer. And today we're discussing the fallout from the storming of the U.S. Capitol. That means we'll get into the events that took place on January 6th and how those events are likely to affect the future of Trump, the future of the Republican Party, the future of the online information ecosystem, and the future of America itself. So, Brett, thanks for coming back on the pod for this, uh, <laughs> this occasion. <laughs> Always. That's a lot you just laid out there. <laughs> yeah, well, we've got a lot to get into. And before we get into all that, I think it's really important to just lay out the facts of what happened, the timeline of, of events on January 6th, because I have a feeling that the impact of what happened on January 6th is going to be talked about by historians for centuries and how it's going to affect our information ecosystem, our political ecosystem is going to be pretty profound. So let's start with what actually happened on January 6th. So at 12 p.m., President Trump gives a speech in front of the White House encouraging protesters to march on the Capitol. And he tells them he will be there with them as they march down Pennsylvania Avenue. Mm. This is when the crowd starts to gather outside the Capitol. It's also worth noting that the Stop the Steal movement was planned publicly for weeks leading up to the event on major social media platforms like Twitter and also on lesser known but still really popular apps like Parler. At 1 p.m., Congress begins their joint session to certify the electoral results of the election. Pence says he does not have the authority to overturn the results, so it looks like it is going in the direction of the results will be certified. At 2 p.m., the pro-Trump mob storms the Capitol. There's very few law enforcement at the scene, so the protesters are quickly able to get past the barricades and they start scaling the steps to the Capitol. At 2.24 p.m., Trump tweets that, quote, Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done. At 2.33 p.m., Ted Cruz sends out a fundraising email asking supporters to, quote, stand with him in his fight to reject electors. And I will say Ted Cruz denies knowing that this email was being sent out at that time, but it definitely looks bad. Uh, at 2.38 p.m., Trump tells supporters to remain peaceful and to support the local law enforcement that are on that are really on their side. So that's something in favor of Trump. At 2.42 p.m., that's when Congress goes into lockdown. At 3.08, that's when there's reports of shots fired. So we know now that a pro-Trump supporter died while storming the Capitol. Uh, she was a military veteran while she was trying to go in through some sort of entry. Uh, she was shot by police forces. There was also a policeman who died at the scene and three other people died on that day, we now know, for five people total. At 6.01 p.m., Trump tweets, quote, these are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so un unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. He then tells them to go home with love and in peace, remember this day forever. One hour later, at 7.02 p.m., Twitter locks Trump's account for 12 hours and says that if, they, that if he puts out anything else after the 12-hour period um, that goes against their terms of service, he'll be banned permanently. And if you recall, he sent out that video after the 12 hours, which almost looked like a hostage video. He was very much trying to be within Twitter's terms of service. And after that time, he put out some other tweets that were a little bit maybe not okay based on Twitter's thinking. And as of now, as of today, Trump has been permanently suspended, not only from Twitter, but also from Facebook, Google, Snapchat, Instagram, Spotify, Shopify, Reddit, Twitch, YouTube, Pinterest, and even TikTok. Which, which he had threatened to ban in 2020 and now has actually banned him first. And not only that, but also Amazon Web Services has banned Trump from, and, and, sorry, has banned Parler from using their services because it goes against their terms of service. And Apple and Google have removed Parler from the app stores. So there is a lot to unpack here, and we're going to get into the question of, is free speech dead on the internet? Was this the right move? Was it the wrong move? But before we get into that whole angle, 
I just want to ask you, how bad could this have gotten? Because yes, five people died, but what, like, could this have possibly turned into a firefight if, you know, more than just one shot had gone off? And the other thing I want to ask you, Brett, is was there ever a chance in hell that this could have actually been successful, that the coup attempt could have actually succeeded? So, you know, what are your thoughts there? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the second question, no. <laughs> it was not going to ever be successful just based off of the number of people that were in that proximity at that time. And, you know, Metropolitan Police in D.C. and the National Guards in Virginia or Maryland or any of the military at Andrews Air Force Base or any of the other bases that are nearby would have put that down easily. So, so that, you know, to answer the second question, um, no, I, I don't think it would have been, you know, I don't think it was actually a, a, there was a full threat of complete overthrow. Right. I'll say that. Cause and, even and, if, even if they had done, like, even if their plan had gone as well as it possibly could have from, from the pro Trump perspective and they occupied the Capitol it's hard to believe that the rest of the country would have just gone along with that. Oh, for sure, for sure. And could it have been much worse? Oh, my God, yes. You could have had way more people die. I mean, when I was watching all this, um, you know, I, I have friends at who were at the Capitol that day or who were working in the um, House or Senate office buildings, and, like, I was genuinely worried about their safety. Um, and it could have gotten a lot worse. You could have had a lot more people die. Knowing that kind of crowd and their political leanings, I wouldn't be surprised if more people were strapped at the time. Mm -hmm. um, another thing which doesn't seem to be getting a lot of coverage is the bombs that were planted could have gone off. I mean, I'm sorry I'm laughing. It's pretty Oh, serious, I didn't know about that. There were bombs planted at the DNC, the RNC, and I believe at one other location. So those could have gone off, and that would have meant mass death and property destruction, the second being obviously less important than people dying or being maimed. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, it could have been way worse. The next thing I want to ask about is how could this have happened? How could they have been able to storm the Capitol? And I read this Business Insider article where they talked to all of these security experts and they all say there were so many holes in the plan to secure the Capitol that it looks like criminal negligence. It looks like there any normal protest event, especially if you know if it were a Black Lives Matter event, there would be so many policemen. There would be a line. They would restrict movement. They'd be putting out more tear gas than was put out. So you know, part of the question is, was there some sort of planning or or you know omission? And regardless of whether it could have actually resulted in a successful coup, it does seem like a lot of our foreign, you know, a lot of allies and other countries and governments around the world, they're looking at this as a legitimate coup attempt that just happened to fail. So as far as the implications of how it's perceived globally, it's, you know, it's something that people are taking very seriously. Yeah, I mean, at the, at the first part, you know, was there negligence? I, I don't know, but obviously there needs to be a huge investigation into all of this. I know that Congressman Tim Ryan, who I guess is in charge of oh, yeah. uh, I saw his uh, the appropriation, yeah, the appropriation subcommittee that has jurisdiction over the legislative branch, meaning the Capitol police, because they're a legislative agency. They answer to Congress, not to the president. Um, I mean, whether there is an omission, there's an omission on its face and whether it was done knowingly, uh, you know, I don't know, but the mm -hmm. omission seems pretty obvious. I can tell you as someone who's around those buildings pretty often, there's always protests going on. And that should just be par for the course for them to be able to handle it and respond proportionally. And I'm surprised that, I mean, they knew about this for weeks. Where was any kind of riot gear? Right. I, you know, I'm not saying that as like, yeah, that's, you know, the, I, I'm not saying like, yeah, we should militarize the police. But like, you would think that if you're going to deploy riot police with riot gear in other cities for other kinds of protests, that you should have done that for this protest, and that and that it wouldn't just be the Capitol Police that they have jurisdiction over that immediate area. You would have the D.C. Metropolitan Police on standby, and that you would also potentially have the National Guard because there's credible evidence that suggested that 
some of these people could have come armed. Yeah. And if that's the case, then you want to make sure that they aren't there causing violence. Yeah. I mean, I would say like, you know, two things can be true. It's true that they shouldn't have been able to get anywhere near the doors of the Capitol building, especially while Congress is in session and multiple people who are in the line of the presidency, people like Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi, they should not have been, you know, protesters should not have been able to get anywhere near the doors of the Capitol. At the same time, given how few Capitol police officers were at the scene, once they're overwhelmed, I I can totally see why they decided not to open fire, right? Like, I actually think that was a good move for them to be like, hey, yeah, go out, have at it, like, you know, destroy some stuff inside. That's better than hundreds of people getting shot potentially. Um, But, you know, there was that one video of Capitol Police just like literally like standing by while protesters just go in and there was one policeman that had a selfie with them. So I wonder how much of this is because there wasn't the feeling of the same level of threat than you would perhaps from like, you know, a BLM protest, just from like the police officer's perspective. And also like, you know, there was just once they're overwhelmed and there's that many people like, you know, you don't have that many choices. It's like you shoot them or you don't shoot them. Right. So, yeah, I, I can understand if they were overwhelmed. And that goes back to the original problem, which is you should have been planning for this. Mm-hmm. Like whoever was in charge, the sergeant at arms or the uh, Capitol Police chief, uh, both or the head of the Capitol Police, both of whom have now resigned. Um, but there should still be an investigation into like why they failed so massively. And I would probably be skeptical of it just just purely being incompetence, though that certainly does happen. It, you know, right. it could be incompetence. And it is troubling to see that you have police officers who are taking selfies. I can understand saying, like, making the tactical decision of like, OK, we cannot respond because, you know, with with the kind of with, with deadly force or or serious or severe force, because that's going to lead to even more of a riot. Right. Mm-hmm. That's going to. put, But um, taking selfies like what the fuck? Yeah. How is that at all reasonable? How is that all within? How is that within your duties? I don't see any police taking selfies uh, with other protesters. Right. But, well, this this gets into the question of the double standard of if this were a BLM protest, would they have been treated as gently as the Capitol Police treated the the stop the steal protesters? Yeah, I, I don't think so. And I take great offense at any double standards. I think it's bullshit Mm -hmm. and it's offensive to most people's sensibilities when they encounter a double standard i do want to make it clear though that we are comparing you're always comparing different circumstances Mm -hmm. that's just that's just what happens when you're dealing with individual happenings um and you're also dealing with capital police versus municipal police and they might have different ability or capability which still brings up the question of why why you know, why weren't the D.C. police called in? I'm pretty sure that right. Bowser was calling for the National Guard to come in. Well, and, and even help. after the Capitol had been stormed, it was really slow for there to be an actual response. And, you know, Trump had said in his first video after he was suspended by Twitter for 12 hours that he called in the National Guard right away. And someone's like, yeah, Trump called in the National Guard right away, just like how I just saw your text from two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean that sucks and it's obviously not true um but it's like such a an impactful lie that doesn't sound like it is even as inflammatory as the other lies that led to all of this mm-hmm. but it's still so so impactful yeah you know um so well, well i want to get into now like who is the most at fault in this situation because no one's happy with what ha- with what went down and a lot of people are saying, we got to arrest all those protesters. You know, we really need to like th- put them in jail, throw away the key. But from my perspective, it's like a lot of those protesters really thought they were doing a patriotic act. From their perspective, they've been brainwashed into thinking that the election was really stolen and they believe they are defending the democracy of America. So from my perspective, it's hard to put too much blame on the protesters. They're sort of like the chumps that followed along. And then there's also the enablers, people like Ted Cruz and Joss Hawley. And then there's the president himself. 
So how would you, you know, if you're thinking about how to serve justice, where do you place blame for this? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll add another category, which is the people who were causing active, like, criminal harm. So, mm -hmm. one, protesters, everyone has the right to protest. There's time and place and manner restrictions and all that. But, like, if you believe something batshit loony, like, like the election was totally stolen, which, what is it now, like 60 or 80 judges or something, mm -hmm. some of whom are Trump appointed, have just said, no, that, that's baseless. Or, like, chemtrails, um, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen, if you want to, if you're like a Lyndon LaRouche head or whatever, you, you can go protest whatever you want. And I'll just say you're nuts and keep walking on. But when you engage in criminal activity, um, all bets are off. I mean, if you're like that guy who, you know, on the low end of criminal activity, let's say just the trespassing, still bad. Um, the uh, people who were smashing glass, I saw that. People who were assaulting well, so, police officers. Someone stole Nancy Pelosi's laptop. So the, the yeah. security risks of this are pretty, pretty potentially pretty massive. That that Yahoo from Arkansas that put his feet up on the desk and stole Nancy oh, yeah. Pelosi's mail or something. That guy who stole Adam Johnson, the guy from I think Bradenton, Florida, who stole the speaker's podium. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy with the long orange yeah. hair, smiling, waving. Um, but the, the ones that get me the most in terms of immediate, like imminent criminal act for for which I think that there's probably the greatest case of, of saying that, like, they were actively trying to plan some kind of violence or I wouldn't say coup because that's the military getting involved. Usually mm -hmm. this is maybe an auto gulp. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've seen that. Um, whatever you want to call it you're really just parsing terms at that point but the guys one the guy that planted the bombs mm. that's just unequivocally that's well and the guy with the tactical gear that had all of these zip ties and that and that guy and i yeah. was talking about this i was talking about this with someone yesterday it was like you know if you're trying this case and if you're advocating for if i were the prosecutor i would say okay you have a guy who's dressed in tactical gear who has a, a holster with a gun in it and he has zip ties given all of those circumstances is there any other reasonable explanation other than like does anyone use <laughs> zip ties for anything other than restraining people right no of course not like he was obviously going in there to restrain people who knows i would probably say members of congress <laughs> which yeah. like if i had to but then you've got to kind of prove intent but for me if I were reviewing that evidence, I would say, yeah, that guy's probably the And worst. there was a gallows set up outside of the Capitol Shame. building. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes just... sometimes a gallows or, or a guillotine is set up for um, symbolic reasons. Like it's, you know, sometimes they do it as more of a theatrical event. But what one reporter I saw was saying is that this was a fully functioning gallows. This is not like just some like prop. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and, and, you know, I'm not saying it's not like every person at the protest wanted to tie up members of Congress and potentially execute them. But were was some small percentage of them willing to do that because they thought it was the patriotic thing to do, given how many people were there and the the level of severity that it came to, it, it seems quite likely that there were probably more than a few nuts out there that, you know, given the right environment would have gone to those lengths. Yeah. Any of those people who were out there to commit violence and they had planned it, even if they hadn't planned it, if they committed the violence anyway, they should be tried. <laughs> and, yeah. and hopefully if the evidence is there convicted and frankly, the evidence is there. Like, right. That building, the Capitol building, is a stone. It's just a massive stone building. The entire complex that they were all in is those are all stone buildings and they have their own cell towers. So it's very easy to see who is in the Capitol at any point because your mm. phone is constantly pinging those towers saying, I'm awake, I'm awake, I can take a call. And um, so it's really easy to just tr you could track down any of the people that were there. That's not good necessarily because. I don't believe that a surveillance state, you know, there needs to be like actual probable cause to be able to track someone and do something like that. Everyone is, should be afforded due process. Um, and then there's also just all of the live footage that fucking idiots took of themselves doing crimes, which fucking morons. Right, I mean, right. it's like, uh, you know, 
And that's the least of the criticisms that I, you know, any of us could levy at these people. Um, yeah. So what would you say about the enablers like, let's say, you know, Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley? You know, I was pretty compelled when I saw the speech that Mitch McConnell gave where he said, quote, if this election were overturned by mere allegations from the losing side, our democracy would enter a death spiral. And coming from Mitch McConnell, that seemed really powerful. Like he had finally realized how damaging, you know, so many people in America believing the election was fraudulently won would be for our democracy. And then right after he said that, Ted Cruz gets up and argues that 40% of America believes the election was fraudulently won. We can't deny that. And so he wasn't even arguing that it was fraudulently won. He was just arguing, look, 40% of Americans believe it, you know, implied is that we got to do what they think is true, even if it's in fact not true. So I would put a lot, I mean, obviously Trump himself, I think deserves, you know, the buck stops with him, but I think there is a lot of, you know, a lot of blame to go for people like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley. Yeah, I mean, I would have to look and, you know, I think the current Supreme Court standard is like imminent lawless action, right? Is mm -hmm. like what what is not considered free speech? You can't incite people to do a crime. Yeah. Um and or incite people to do something that's lawless. Um and so Trump, you know, you'd have to look at his words and parse it really carefully, and you'd have to really get lawyers going over that and making their cases as to whether it was a direct incitement. I think it had the effect of uh, certainly the effective incitement that we could reasonably, um, that he could probably foresee, Yeah, you know? And, and as for Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, I mean, I think that, you know, it's important that we recognize that they have the right to make those allegations and to question the electors, that slate of electors. And it's incumbent on people who are not opportunistic and not uh, like they are, who are not opportunistic and who have backbones to say, no, that's baseless and to not be chicken shit about it. And to not just say, well, enough of my constituents are fucking deluded that I need to then follow along. You know, mm -hmm. it's actually it's like they need to demonstrate real leadership um, because that's part of the job, you know. Yeah. So what they what they did was probably legal, but just probably very immoral. Well, it's it's legal and it should be and it should be that way. You should be able to question mm -hmm. in case there are instances where right. something got, went wrong. It's well, just it's another check. But what happened here was that politicians cynically used it to show to a significant portion of their base that they were willing to go to bat for them, even when they were going to bat in a game that you weren't going to win and for premises that are entirely unreasonable and right. for which the people believing them are deluded, actually yeah. deluded. So this gets to the question of how could this many people be deluded about something that anyone who's looked at the evidence knows instantly that there's no, there's no there there. And this gets to this notion that I've been really fascinated with the work of Rene Girard. He's the main guy that influenced Peter Thiel. And his whole breakthrough is this notion of mimetic desire, which is that in any society, in any culture, we learn what's desirable through our interactions with others. So obviously, like when you grow up in school, it's like, oh, there's like the cool, like, oh, this is the cool, like Tamagotchis are cool this year, Furbies are cool this year, whatever. Or like, you know, in the art world, like Banksy can go try to sell his art on the street and no one will buy it. But once you see like it's in a gallery for $10 million, like everyone wants it because they see everyone else that wants it. So rather than just thinking about a one line, you know, an arrow between I want to overturn the election, all of these people having that arrow, it's actually triangular desire. So there's I desire to overturn the election, but I'm mediating my desires through President Trump. So it's only because President Trump really wants to overturn the election that I also want to overturn the election. If Trump never said that the results were fraudulent and he, you know, basically was like, you know, we had a good run. Thank you, everyone. Like, like no one would have really fought or cared as much to overturn the, the results. So I think just when you look at, at what's going on through that lens, it's so clear that whether or not Trump specifically incited violence 
it is because of his propagation of this lie that it has even been possible. Well, yeah, and, and it's, it's a feedback loop, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you have media outlets like OANN or Newsmax, and now, I mean, Fox is on the ads with, you know, those, those yeah. people. Um, uh, they say, wow, there's an opportunity to make a lot of profit here because there's enough people that believe this, so we got to keep selling this. We, we mm. You know, the news... Brett Weinstein a, calls it audience capture. Like, they have to sure, do what yeah. the audience wants. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's they, because they're a for-profit institution that has a specific market niche, they realize we got to tell these people a reality that they want to hear. And mm -hmm. then it just feeds off of each other because those institutions, those outlets have credibility with their audience because their audience likes what they hear. And so then it's just, it's, it's confirmation vicious... bias. It's people love to hear what they believe told back. Exactly. To them. Exactly. And you can find this you can find this effect in different ecosystems too, outside of the scope of our current, you know, discussion. But you can find it in different set-off communities. Um, so you know, I, oh yeah, I, I mean that's yeah. You know, Gerard Rene Gerard talks about how all throughout human history there has been this tit for tat violence retaliation, where two groups will be, you know, something will happen, like someone will kill someone else. And then that group, you know, retaliates and kills someone on your side. And it goes back and back and back until potentially the whole civilization could die because they're all at war. And what tends to happen in these cultures is they'll find a scapegoat who's a neutral scapegoat. And they'll say, look, it's not us. It's really this guy. He's the one that's the real person to blame. And it has to be a neutral party because if the scapegoat was on either side, Right. then it would just be the tit for tat retaliation would continue. And they basically use this scapegoat and they kill them and that's how they're able to heal. Um, but obviously that doesn't, you know, that's not the healthiest way to run a society. And we've kind of evolved beyond that where we it's been shown, like scapegoating has been shown for what it is. So it doesn't mm -hmm. really work anymore. And the, the Christian approach is to have like, Jesus was a willing scapegoat who was actually innocent. And so that was like one strategy for bringing in a modern world that can do away with scapegoating. But it kind of feels like what's happening now between the Democrats and the Republican is this like, like Mitch McConnell said, it's like a death spiral where both sides is so willing to retaliate against the other that it's hard for me to see how we can escape this unless there's some way for the pro-Trump base to save face. And for it not to be like Trump or his base as the as the one that we all blame. Well, so it's interesting what you described, like this idea of, you know, tit for tat, um, you know, uh, approach to um, justice, which isn't justice, it's vengeance. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, you know, you had the idea of um, I know, like in, in Germanic tribes, they had, you know, blood feuds. Yeah. And then and then, you know, sometimes to resolve the blood feuds that enough people don't die, you give someone one family might give one that has been harmed wear guilt, man, man money. It's like, Hey, sorry, we accidentally killed this guy. Here's some money and pay. Let's settle this whole thing. Um, yeah. I mean, the usual solution for that is law <laughs> is that you have a right. codified system of laws and you have due process and you have neutral tribunals where you go through things and you suss out the facts. But what seems to have happened here is that that happened with the election but you had enough people that did not have faith in the institutions for one mm. reason or another. And I'd like to get into that. Um, they didn't have faith in the institutions. So they were looking for someone who would speak to their quote unquote truth, which doesn't is not grounded in reality. Um, and they're willing to follow them and be deluded. I mean, I was listening to this audio of this lady who was saying who was crying and she was like, it's a revolution. Like we're supposed right. to. And it's like it's like, well, yeah, man, you really got suckered into this. Um <laughs> And, and I think part of the root cause of this is, and I'm going to preface this, you're always going to have people who are, who are, you know, materially secure, but are just a little off their rocker. They might mm -hmm. have mental illness or, or something or whatever that is untreated um, that leads them to embracing certain behaviors or ideologies or attitudes, there's always going to be some percentage of people who are just racist and kind of shitty, right? Mm -hmm. um, no matter what their personal life is like, you know, they might be wealthy as all hell, but they just have some personality flaw that leads them to be 
crappy in some designate, you know, in some ways. But I think one of the keys is you don't want to create a fertile enough field for those people to grow. And right. the way that you make sure that the field isn't fertile is by making sure that people generally people, if they are secure in their lives, will be happy. And if they have like the basics of material comforts, like if you have someone who's living in a shack who sees the immense wealth or success of other people that are still within the jurisdiction but seem a world away, that's going to just breed resentment. Mm -hmm. And they're going to look for some kind of ideology that explains why that is the case. Um, and then they're going to use that to guide their life. So let's take for an example um, QAnon. Let's say mm -hmm. you got a guy in a trailer who really believes in this and he sees the seeming nonsense that goes on in Washington, the double talk, the, you know, saying one thing and doing completely another thing in terms of policy. Um, they see that and they go, well, why should I trust this? And then, you know, their material conditions degrade so much that they're looking for an answer. And then you get some guy on 4chan who just says like, hey, did you know that all of them are actually pedophiles? Well, you know, I think like you're hitting on a really important point, which is that it's because of the profound distrust in the mainstream media institutions that leads to this like super echo chamber where if you don't trust anything that the mainstream media puts out, then you're more likely to listen to some random guy on 4chan or someone who's saying something that's not what the mainstream media is putting out. And by the way, like I think they have some legitimate grievances with the way the mainstream media portrays events. Like it is true that the Black Lives Matter protests were largely reported favorably by the media, even though it resulted in some looting and destruction. And, you know, they famously during that protest, they're like, oh, yeah, we really cared about COVID earlier. But now that there's these protests, like, you know, right. don't and, care and, about and, it. So I can the, see the, the CNN still. You remember that the CNN still where it was like protests, mostly peaceful. It's like, right, right. Flames <laughs> it. it's like, man, oh, bad Chiron. Yeah. Like you got to like. Yeah, so I, I can one. see, like, from the Republican perspective, like, why they have some distrust in the media institutions. But the big concern that I have is that at least when we're all on the same platforms, like when we're all on Twitter, when we're all on Facebook, there is some overlap. So if I say something totally batshit crazy, someone's going to reply to that with a more normal take. And we at least have some foothold in reality when we're all in the same public square, for lack yeah. of a better term. But when we start to, uh, you know, fracture our public square into all these various parts, which is seems to be what's happening now. Part of what I'm concerned about is that then you have extremist groups that are in like a super echo chamber that doesn't have any foothold in reality. And there's no moderate or liberal or, or any people who, that have diverse opinions that are on that platform. So it could lead to, you know, a more normal background level of domestic terror from far right groups. Yeah. It could lead to a greater fracturing of our institutions and trust in our institutions. So I'd love to get your thoughts on like, first of all, was it the right move for Twitter to ban Trump? And, you know, what do you think like the potential fallout is from that? Like what's Trump going to do now that he no longer can post to anywhere? Like, you know, there's it's a it's a big open question and a lot of people are wondering about it. You know, I feel like any opinion now I that I give is not going to be so fully informed, but but and that it could change. I mean, it really could. Yeah. There's so much information that's just coming in and so many updates and so many different considerations that I just want to say I reserve the right for me to be completely wrong here. <laughs> totally, <laughs> and, yeah. And, you know, and and I guess that goes for most things. Um, broad disclaimer, very lawyerly. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I approach this with the sense of, with the understanding that Twitter is a private company that can do kind of whatever it wants right. in regard to its platform. Um, and that it can say, okay, well, I, the president was clearly went against our standards, our community standards, and he can't use our website for posting, which is really what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. But then, w which is what it is in form. But then we also have to think about the actual effect of what right. they, what Twitter actually is. Yes, it's a website for posting and for shitty memes or whatever. It's kind of fun, but <laughs> um, but it, it it was a way for the 
president, one of the most powerful people in the world, to communicate policy and ideas. And so my gut is that we need to put in place rules to make sure that no major you know, tech company is able to just silence anyone at any time. Because here's an example. I don't listen to this podcast, but I know that, and I don't know why it was banned. I just saw. Red Scare. Pod- Red Scare, yeah. Um, and and I don't know what they said. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really listen to them. I know that they're affiliated with other, you know. Um, but that's always something to keep in mind is that, you know, these guidelines and policies, yes, you might cheer them on for someone that does something as disgusting as what Donald Trump has done, and has done and had done and has done since, you know, what, 2011 or whatever. Um, but just be careful because the, the it doesn't always just work out, you know. Right. Censor- it's not censor- always censor- just going to be people who you don't like that get censored. It may it- eventually be people that you actually think should be able to speak freely. Exactly. And again, I don't know what Red Scare's deal is. I don't know what they say, whatever. So but but I did hear that they are more aligned with people who are not aligned with Donald Trump. And so you might wonder then, like, okay, where does the buck stop? Um, And what's so interesting about, you know, there's always this big distinction between, well, the First Amendment prevents the government from stopping you from saying something. It doesn't prevent others from saying uh, stopping you from saying something. And that is true. That is how it's written. But you also want to think about why it was written and what was the purpose. I mean, I assume that back when it was written, corporations were not, they were a young concept, certainly younger than now. Um, yeah, they couldn't have may- expected that the public square would eventually become this digital ecosystem where anything you say can be instantly read by billions of people. Like that, yeah. that was nowhere on their mind when they... Yeah, the and, that, and that the government, specifically a really a government under a sovereign, right? A king, you know, even a constitutional monarch like George the Third, still had, you know, almost almost I wouldn't say absolute power because there's a, a parliament, but significant power. Mm-hmm. Um, that the First Amendment was there to protect people's free speech when the government was was the overarching um, entity which could limit your free yeah. speech. So the question is, what other large entities exist now that have power that's equivalent to what the First Amendment was trying to protect uh, people from? And so, you know, my gut says, I don't necessarily want just an unaccountable board of people at Facebook or Twitter, entities which have almost near control over how most Americans communicate realistically. Um I don't necessarily want them to have the ability to just say, nope, you're not allowed on, you know, what you said offended our board or whatever, and we're not going to allow you on our platform. And de facto, we're not going to allow you to engage in the mediums of communication that almost everyone uses. Totally. Well, let's assume that Twitter and Facebook are the modern day public square, and therefore they are subject to the First Amendment. The The way I was thinking about this is like, first of all, can anything be prevented? Can any form of speech be prevented? And it seems pretty obvious that yes, some forms of speech for sure can be prevented. An easy example is child pornography. If you're an account that's posting child porn and you're you know, organizing child porn groups and whatever else, yeah. you can and should be banned permanently from the public square. And that's not going against the First Amendment. So the next question is, okay, if, if you can't do child porn, could you do incitements to violence? And it seems pretty clear that the First Amendment does not allow shouting fire in a crowded theater. You cannot incite violence. So the next question is, did Trump incite violence? And this is a little bit trickier because Trump speaks kind of like a mob boss where he doesn't say anything directly that'll like, that you could actually like put him in jail for. He'll be like, you know, people are saying like, I'm hearing lots of things, like maybe it's yeah. true, you never know. So, so it's hard to say like, okay, yes, this specific tweet is the thing where he incited violence. You have to think about what is the fallout from this? You know, is this quote, the end of the open internet? I think that that happened a long time ago. I mean, I think you and I remember, and this is, maybe putting a date on how old we are. I guess most people know. But like, I remember being younger in like the early 2000s, the mid 2000s, you know, E-bombs world era. Like yeah. when, 
it was just the wild west. I mean, there was no, you know, the only guards were like, you know, uh, ISPs could, you know, on your router, you could put like a parental, you know, filter or whatever, but there was no, you know, this was before you had large entities, like large big tech entities, you know, not Microsoft or Dell or, you know, the hardware companies we're talking like, this was before the, I guess the browser based ones, right? Like this is before Netflix or Facebook or Amazon or any of them had any, had the mass institutional government, like almost governmental power that they have now. Um, so that's that's gone. That's gone forever, and it it sucks and you know sad, but things move on. Um, we're in a completely different era now, where those entities, because they control the flow of information and politics and government and social movements, depend on the flow of information. Um, they have immense power. Oh yeah, and, like if and, there was any question of who was the most powerful people in the country or the world. It's Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, and it's incumbent on people that that are skeptical of hierarchies and arbitrary exercise of power to question hierarchies that do have that power. And I'm not saying that they're acting in an unarbitrary way. I, that's going to be for each particular yeah. instance you have to review. But I am skeptical, <laughs> you know, of, yeah, so, any, of any... Yeah. Someone was like, it'll be interesting to see what... It's what the dynamics are like the next time Jack and Zuck go before Congress. And then someone replied and they're like, more like when Congress has to go before Jack and Zuck. I mean, yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, uh, what, you know, what, what happens? So I saw a tech or a tweet by Jen Palmieri, who is like part of the um, I think she was Secretary Clinton's press aide or, or something. I mean, she's communications director. She's a, a prominent um, official or operative or, or D.C. Mm -hmm character um and she said something like well now the and i believe I'm, i might be misquoting here but it was something like well now you know the committees of jurisdiction that are reviewing facebook and twitter are run by democrats so like here's what we can expect and it's like yeah. oh that's that's not good no yeah <laughs> you know? there's consolidation of power for sure i would also say like i guess from my own perspective i think jack did the best that he could with a really difficult situation. If you recall, you know, during Trump's 12 hour suspension, hundreds of Twitter employees uh, petitioned that Trump should be banned permanently. And many people were saying, oh yeah, I can't believe Jack let it go this far. He should have banned Trump like years ago. And then other people are saying, I can't believe he banned Trump. This is the end of the open internet. Like he should never have done that. So it's a really hard decision for someone like Jack to make. and. Because I think Jack is actually a rational actor who's a good faith actor who is really trying to do what is best for everyone. I'm not so concerned about what happens to Twitter under Jack. And I actually have a pretty good opinion of Mark Zuckerberg. I think his stance on free speech has been pretty consistent. And the big concern I have is what could happen if there's not a good actor in charge of these social media giants like that's the real danger to me is not what our current dynamics are with zuck and jack and and the politics it's really what could happen with this power if it's wielded by the wrong type of person well that's always the concern too right i mean is that anytime you grant a hierarchy um private or public power whether you off you know when you authorize that you always have to assume that it's going to be potentially exercised by uh, that that authority might be exercised by someone who might not have everyone's best intentions in mind which is why i think that things which we define as being of utmost importance to society need to be protected uh, or maybe not protected by the government but there needs to be a there needs to be access by the public the public mm -hmm. should be able to if facebook and twitter are going to have um, almost unilateral control over uh, um, the forums of speech. And if there is just a particular group of companies that are going to have, you know, control over all of the forums of speech, then they should be held accountable to the public, not necessarily just shareholders. Maybe they should be forced to convert into kinds of companies that, um, like public utilities that are more regulated. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Public utilities or they, or everyone in the country owns a share or can have a vote or I, I, I yeah. don't know. Um, well, well what I think to be more accountability. Totally. 
what I think is going to happen, and we've talked about this before, but I think this is basically going to really speed up the move to decentralization. And I bet already there are entrepreneurs who are pitching a decentralized form of Twitter that could be based on the blockchain. And, you know, the way the blockchain works, like no one can prevent anyone from holding Bitcoin or, or transferring it or selling it. It's totally decentralized. So I think what's going to happen is eventually we're going to have everyone's going to have their own blog or RSS feed that's on the blockchain that no one could shut down, even if they really wanted to. And then on top of that, we'll have new social media apps that aggregate all of that decentralized information. And I think that's like, honestly, probably what the best evolution of the internet is. But it's, it's not going to happen overnight. And there can be a lot of a lot of bad things that could take place between now and then. Um, so I'll get your reaction on that. And then I want to ask you about the future. I mean, even with the decentralization, which, you know, I agree with that you could create something that's insulated where everyone can speak and, and what they say, um, you know, provided it isn't illegal, right? Like we're not talking about like people, you know, it's, it's not acceptable for people to be, you know, distributing child pornography, right? Like mm -hmm. in your example. But or, at least like it would be uh, tied back to your wallet address. So you could, right. uh, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to take down their post. But right. you would know who it is and then you could exactly, arrest them yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Um, for things which are illegal, yeah. I mean, it's still subject to the same issue, which is that people will curate and choose what news they want to hear and what reality they want to construct. And so it still does, you know, it, it's, it's good in the sense that you aren't leaving it to, you're individualizing it. Mm -hmm. Everyone can create their own reality, but, but there are going to be plenty of people that create one that isn't actually grounded in the real reality, right? Things that right. we can like measure or that we bounce off of other people and they say, yeah, we agree. Right. Because that's what reality is. It's generally an, an agreement amongst, you know, a, a majority or more of people um, for things that are social conventions. And then for things which are physical, you know, there's measurements or there's proofs that you can do, right? Yeah. Rules of logic underlying those too. Yeah, well, let's get into what is likely to happen in the future with the future scenarios. Let's start with the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. Yeah, I mean, the, the question is, is where do the people who genuinely believe this kind of stuff, where do they go? If Trump no longer holds political office, you know, are they still just going to feed off of that kind of off of the news that he, the quote unquote news that or information that he's putting out through a media outlet? Or are they going to, um, you know, how how is their how is their reception of information going to cascade through the rest of society? Uh, that That's always the question. And and which politicians are going to take advantage of that vote, which is now up for mm. grabs? Yeah. That's a question. Um you know, when I think of the worst thing that could happen, I could think of a lot of people who are prone to that kind of thinking, forming their own militias. You know, I think something like Waco or Ruby Ridge, where these people, you know, get weapons and they do something bad. They mm -hmm. form compounds. You know, they do something that's akin to uh, uh, what Timothy McVeigh did in 1996, right? The mm -hmm. uh, Oklahoma City bombings. Um, I. I I can't imagine that that would be really likely. I really hope that it's not likely um, because that would be, that's awful. That's disturbing. A lot of people dying is, is no, uh, never a good thing. Um, just in case there are any questions about that amongst <laughs> the audience. Um, but, you know, in terms of what could realistically happen, I mean, I think I had said back in November that in terms of political violence, and I feel a little bit vindicated, unfortunately, is that, uh, you could see something that is akin to um, the troubles in Ireland and Northern Ireland, where you have people that are armed, they're paramilitaries, they exist, these sectarian groups exist in pockets of the country, mm. and perhaps they carry out acts of, uh, you know, acts of violence, which, you know, may, might be limited, they might be extensive. I'm not saying that there will be people you know, that there will be armed engagements and guerrilla warfare or anything like that. But I think that there are people that will still be discontent and will cling on to guns 
or to other weapons and, and will opportunistically um, be violent. I mean, yeah. I, I, hate to, I hate to say that. I hate saying it, and it's disgusting that the violence even happened. But now, I mean, it's, it's happened. And people yeah. now, you know, can look at that and say, well, it failed, but now I'll, you know, th- this person will say they'll try again. And what would you say is the worst case for what happens with invoking the 25th impeachment? What happens to Trump and the GOP after all this? I mean, I think impeachment is important from my political view. I think it's meaningful for the House to impeach Trump a second time mm-hmm. because that has never happened. And it's un- for unprecedented action. There has to be an unprecedented response. Um Now, in terms of actually carrying that out, I think I read something about how the Senate is out until January 19th. So that would be unlikely it'll actually go through. Yeah. I mean, there's no time to do that. Um, And then what's Trump going to do after all this? If he can't post to anything, what's the worst case scenario of what he could do? I mean, the worst case scenario is he founds, you know, he, he creates his own network and he acts as a, as a, not silent, far from silent, he acts as a kingmaker um, where mm-hmm. he has his own information channels that, you know, maybe not 70 million people listen into, but you might have a good, like, 30 million who listen into that. Yeah, um, like maybe, Alex maybe, Jones now. Alex Jones has been banned, and he's still fairly influential. Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, he'll have his own base, and he can have his own, you know, I'm sure that there will be a web hosting service that wants to cash in, and will say, yeah, sure, we'll host your, you know, well, host your show or whatever out of some server farm in Idaho. Um, mm-hmm. and, and from there, he acts as a radicalizing force on the right wing. Um, and the worst case is that he continues being a player and, and having access to the public discourse and making Republicans in elected office actually have to respond to the things that he's saying. That's worrisome because they're always running for re-election the Republican base is usually pretty conservative. And so they constantly have to, you know, and my hope is that, well, maybe I'll save this for the later portion, but my hope is that there might be some electoral reform, which means that you don't have people having to listen to the crazies on the fringe in order to get past the first gate, you know, the, the primary so that they get to the general. Yeah. Um, well, well, one, uh, I think it was Chris Hayes, the reporter who said that for what it's worth, he thinks that Ted Cruz and Josh Howley are making the right bet as far as where the base will go. And, you know, someone like Ted Cruz, he's trying to position himself as the next Republican nominee. And so, yeah, it seems like, you know, if you're a betting man on what's the best way to get the Republican ticket in 2024, you know, staying with the base and, you know, basically buying in and supporting their delusions is probably your best bet at power yeah i mean i'm shaking my head back and forth no but i agree with you i'm just yeah. i'm compelled to by just pure disappointment yeah is like let's hope that that doesn't happen in fact there's a way to work around it i think which is through electoral reforms to make sure that well let's people, talk about that let's yeah, go into yeah. the best case scenario best case scenario yeah i mean i think best case scenario is that Democrats, you know, use their now control over over Congress and the presidency to advance um, policies, which one are going to make people less predisposed toward believing that our institutions don't work. Like uh, what I mean by that is passing meaningful policies that make people's lives better so Mm. that there is renewed faith in the institutions and so that people say, oh, actually, Congress and the president do work for me. Like they made my life better. I'm happy. I don't have to believe in, you know, Pizzagate or whatever. Um, So that's that's, you know, that's a bit rosy. Even rosier, I think, is that it would be great to have electoral reforms that mean that you have multi party or multi member districts. So let's say, for example, um, you know, you're in California. and I'm just going to round down. Let's say California has 50 members of the House and it's all and all of those House members are elected um, on a statewide level. 
So you don't have one congressman for San Bernardino or for, you know, San Francisco or whatever. It's all on the state level. And instead, what you do is um, is each party that's active in the state comes up with their own slate and people vote for I vote for that slate. You know, um, and so let's say I vote for the Democrats and the Democrats get 60 percent of the vote. Well, then they would get whatever 60 percent of 50 is uh, 30. They would get 30 members of Congress allotted to them and their uh, and their slate would have, you know, at least 50 people on it um, so that those 30 at the top of the slate would then get elected. And so what that would do is it would enable smaller parties to, uh, you know, they wouldn't have to be subsumed by those larger parties. You could have an active Green Party that says, no, I'm not going to form a coalition with the Democrats. They're not doing enough on the environment. And conversely, you could have a batshit loony right wing party. You could have the QAnon party, which gets, you know, three seats or whatever. And they and and my hope is that the mainstream Republicans would say, uh, we're not going to form a coalition with you. You're nuts. We're going to form a coalition with the centrist party, you know, the 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 liberal Dems or whatever. Um, hmm. So that's my hope, because it could reduce it would give a little bit more um, ability for those parties to free wheel. And that's how they do it in other countries too. This it's all proportional representation. You could throw in some ranked choice voting in there too. So you say like, I like the slate of greens, the first Democrats, the second, right. You know, whatever's the third. And I definitely don't like these guys at the bottom. Right. So more ranked voting. So you'd get more of a moderate outcome rather than having to deal with the extremes to the degree that we do now. Exactly. And that those different parts of the coalition could, um, effectively realign more quickly when things mm -hmm. happen because what happens right now is that you do have those factions within the two broader parties so think like new dems and centrist dems and blue dogs on yeah. the more right right side of the republic or democratic party excuse me and you got you know like bernie sanders the squad on the far left they would just be separate parties and they might agree they might join together um, but they wouldn't necessarily have to. And, and what, what that would do is that it would free those people to be able to critique and speak freely because right now, you know, AOC is not going to speak against democratic leadership that too much because that's, she relies on them. You know, she's part mm -hmm. of that party. She's part of that tribe. Um, so that would be my hope in a broad sense is that you could take the people that are believing in this kind of thing, minimize them to the absolute nucleus of just, you know, people that are just so far gone, you can't reach them and then neutralize their ability to have any impact on uh, government. Yeah. And in the best case, would you say like, is there any chance Trump could quietly resign? Because I mean, that seems like what would just be the best for everyone in the country. Yeah, I, I see you shaking your head. Why, I agree. Why, like, why would he do that? Yeah, he, he, he doesn't without giving a date on this, he doesn't have that much time left. I yeah. mean, he's, he's going, I mean, hopefully nothing happens in the intervening time, obviously, but uh, he doesn't have that much time left. It doesn't really make sense. Um, he would only maybe do that if he got pressured enough by party insiders who wanted to say, you got to get out so that you can resign in disgrace and we won't, you know, do won't whatever. Won't be staying on the party as much. Yeah, and that you can maybe save a little bit of your legacy going down the line and that Mike Pence can step in and, quote, you know, restore order in some way. Or I, I don't know how right. we would do realistically. Enough cabinet members have already resigned that, you know, I actually found out on, I think it was Thursday night, I was talking with a colleague and he was like, yeah, well, um, all of the FAA just resigned, like all of the political except for the administrator so you know i don't know <laughs> that just means that there's career employees who the the actual skill you know the people that are knowledgeable at this, about the subject matter and then just one other guy so. yeah and is there any chance that invoking the 25th amendment which is that he's not mentally fit for office or impeachment is there any like in the best case scenario is it possible any either of those could go through i mean given how how little time is left yeah, I don't. I don't think twenty fifth has ever been executed, but you could probably do it. I mean, I, I think it would probably take about a day. You know, yeah. marshal the right people. I don't know the ag exact terms that need to be fulfilled for that to be carried out. But uh, and if you sure were, let's say, you were in Nancy's Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi's shoes, 
Do you think it's a, the right strategic move to put the articles of impeachment on the floor, even if it's not going to pass the Senate, just so you basically put the ball in their court? Yeah, I mean, if I were in your shoes, my feet would hurt. But um, <laughs> sorry, that, that was stupid. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's absolutely the right move. And, and I think it's important because, you know, the members of the House and Senate and politicians in general are always engaging in speech acts. What they are doing, they are trying to bring about change by speaking and by bringing in writing. And, you know, half of the things that they do are writing letters which say, like, I am grieved, you know, gravely concerned about X, Y, Z. Please answer mm -hmm. these questions. Um, and just by doing that, they sometimes get compliance from agencies. And so uh, and so I think it's important that she introduce articles of impeachment purely well, not purely, but primarily because it's important to make the precedent that right. it's such a uniquely horrible president, mm. just awful in almost every regard. Um, he will rank among the worst that our country has ever known in 207, I mean, almost 250 um, years. Just absolutely terrible. Up there with James Buchanan, um, Herbert Hoover, and Warren G. Harding, all of whom were kind of crappy for their own reasons. But... Um, but yeah, I mean, I, and I think it's important for her to make that marker to kick it over to the Senate. And of course, if the Senate doesn't act on it, then that's on them. Yeah. Uh, and as a political move, it's smart, too. Uh, but yeah, she's fully justified and she should. I agree. And the other thing I want to ask you, last thing for the best case is, is there any chance or what would have to happen for the Republican nominee in 2024 to be a moderate like Romney or Kasich? What would have to happen for the more moderate, sensible wing of the Republican Party to become the more mainstream part of the party in 2024? Yeah, in terms of what they would have to do to win is they would have to get more moderates to vote in the primaries. And they would need to be able to play to more of the moderates. And that means that more moderates who end up voting Republican in the general election anyway just need to get more involved on the primary level. Um, mm. And they need to go in and say, hey, we'd really prefer a Mitt Romney or a John Kasich or, or whoever aligns with that wing of the party. Um, they just have to go in and get involved. Or there needs to be a general shift um, where a bunch of the people who are QAnon people or the far, far right, um, or even just the far right, would say, uh, okay, maybe that was a pretty bad idea that's going to end up being bad for America in general, let's maybe try to rein it in on some of the, you know, um, QAnon kind of conspiracy stuff. So that's probably what I see in terms of best cases. Best case, I think what would happen is you just have that party, that part of the party, the far right kind of wither away. Mm -hmm. That's best case. And I don't see how that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, I don't know, maybe if I don't know, whoever runs Newsmax. Maybe it's like out of sight, out of mind because Trump's been banned. It just like doesn't have the same power that it used to. And maybe, yeah. maybe. And that, and that these things feed off of themselves. Um, I don't see that as being very likely. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it's going to be even more. People are going to be lurking in the shadows with these kind of ideas, just waiting. Yeah. You know, that that's what worries me the most. Well, let's get into the most likely. Most likely scenario. The first thing with the most likely, and obviously every day nowadays feels like a historic event, and every historic event changes the paradigm of what's going to happen in the future. Like even Trump getting banned from Twitter versus not getting banned completely changes the trajectory of Trump, the Republican Party. So let's take this with a grain of salt. But the first thing I want to ask you is, in the most likely scenario, is there going to be another event like January 6th? From my perspective, because we already saw January 6th, the Capitol Police and everyone's going to be much more prepared for Biden's inauguration. And so from my perspective, it seems unlikely that we'll have another event as momentous as January 6th, at least for the next you know few months. Um, but I'm curious from your perspective, like, do you think it's likely that there will be some massive, you know, another coup attempt or, or some other major coordinated act of protest or violence 
in the coming, you know, let's say the next like one or two months? Yeah, one or two months, I definitely think that that's not going to happen because I think the wound is still very fresh and people remember uh, and people were rightly horrified by what happened. I think in terms mm -hmm. of the long like road of history, how we're going to probably review it or view it um, in hindsight is probably something much more like the Whiskey Rebellion. You remember back then, like back, I think it was under George Washington, farmers were going to be taxed for whiskey. Um and they marched on Washington. And I don't actually know the full extent of whether they, you know, I'm sure they probably came with weapons. Um, well, at least the whiskey uh, tax was actually something that happened. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, I think that that's probably the long march of it. That's probably how it's going to be viewed. Uh, who knows, again, mm -hmm. really. Um, but I think in the next you know, a few months at the very least, there's going to be much more security around the Capitol and in D.C. in general. Um, something I think is even more likely, President Biden, President-elect Biden said that he was going to introduce domestic or try to introduce domestic terrorism uh, legislation, which to me suggests that we're probably going to go through another period where we empower the government to um, restrict the activities of people um, mm. in similar ways as to, you know, if 9-11 is any template. Like a I Patriot Act on steroids. Probably. Mm. Uh, probably. And it's going to be updated for new mediums now. So, you know, we're not just talking about intercepting phone calls or emails or Google searches or whatever. I mean, it will include all manner of social media content. Um, and, and then there will be action based off of that. And I hope that that what we learn is we learn from the mountain I, mountains, not even enough, the world of mistakes that the government and enforcers made in enforcing, uh, that law. Right. I mean, I, my hope is that people do not get, this was obviously horrible, but my hope is that people do not, uh, do not give up or abrogate their ability to think critically about whatever is going to be the next step. Because, mm. you know, you don't want to get swept up in the passion of saying, well, this just happened. And so now we you don't want to let the pendulum act. swing too far to the other side. The, the Iraq war was a failed war. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I think we can say that now about 15 years after. And almost everyone voted for the um, military or the authorization for the use of military force uh, back when I think it was 2003. Um, and I think now that we can see that was. A failure <laughs> that was that was bad and i think people got swept up in the fervor and my hope is that people think critically about what we should do before we do it mm -hmm. and to not get to, as much as your emotions may be guiding how you feel and how you might want to act think through the ramifications of what you might want to do right um just good advice in general, like yeah. buying a car or whatever. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's have like, long term you... time horizons when you make decisions. Don't just think yeah. about what's happening emotionally right now. Yeah, of course. Of yeah. course. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah. This gets to my last question, which is about what's most likely for our media ecosystem? Yeah, I think in the immediate, you're probably just going to see more moderators on the mainstream just being a little bit more ban happy. Uh, for better or for worse, yeah. um, I can imagine both. Uh, and then I think what's going to happen is you're going to have people just move on to alternate platforms if they can access mm -hmm. them, right? So something like Parler or you know, Vote, I think, is like a Reddit clone that's more, you know, much more right wing and, and off the charts. Um, yeah, I feel like li yeah. like live streaming and audio where it's like Clubhouse is probably going to become more popular because it's not like there's a record of everything that's said. You can kind of yeah. be more freewheeling with your discussions. Yeah, I think that that's much more likely. I also think that people are probably going to take up more, um, you know, as they experience much more moderation and people's natural inclination towards privacy in communications, just because they, you know, they want to be able to be private and also say what they want, right? Um, I think you're going to see people flock more to decentralized kind of nodes or whatever, like you were talking about, um, or just using things more commonly like encryption or whatever, uh, to just contact, um, 
or to engage yeah. in you know whatever kind of social media they want to. And, and I think that there's going to be a huge, maybe not huge, but there's going to be room in the market now for plenty of other um, means of communicating that are kind of seen as a reaction to Twitter, Facebook um, now becoming the man. Oh, right? yeah. Well, Parler was number one in the Apple App Store at the time when it got banned. Yeah. And Telegram is now one of the top apps because Facebook just made a change where you no longer have totally end-to-end -end encryption. Now Facebook in does have some data of yours. And so I think you're right. I think people are going to move more towards those types of apps like Telegram and places where there's true privacy. And I guess just like the final thing I want to remind our listeners, because we're living in such what feel like dire times. And I know I've felt a lot of extra stress. You know, it's been hard to be quite as productive as during a normal week. It very quickly went from Happy New Year to, hey, sorry, I'm responding to your email late. I was distracted by the coup attempt <laughs> yesterday. <Jesus. laughs> Price, so, yeah. will this pass? Is it true that this too shall pass? Yeah, I mean everything passes, right? There's just time. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean I would, I would say, you know, there's going to be a, I think there's going to be a genuine, genuine thirst on the part of most people for a return to um, quiet. Like, you know, there's the media cycle and the constant barrage of, hey, this is really important, whether it is merited or not. And I would say that there are some instances where it's absolutely merited, like on January 6th, or whether it's just the latest scandal of, you know, whatever, and you need to pay attention to it. You need to look at the screen. You need to do this now. Um, I think people are getting to a point where they're vibrating so hard that they're going to break and that, like, there is a limit to how much humans can pay attention and feel the stress from things. I think that there's going to be enough hunger for people to say, I just want politics to be boring again. Like, I just want some crappy dude in a suit to talk about blah, 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 appropriations or whatever on the floor. And I want to not be able to think about it. I want it to, I want there to be a, an Overton window that doesn't include a group of people who think that there's like a huge pedophile ring that every member of Congress is a part of, you know? Um, I think a lot of people think that too. And I think that they're not... I, I, I have encountered people in my work and just in personal life that I disagree with fundamentally on policy issues and how much the government should be involved in different things or what they should be doing or what the government needs to be doing. And I think the one thing that we can agree on is that we're just exhausted. Everyone's just exhausted and they just want to go back to like having some sense of shared normalcy. Um, and I think that's going to come from government and large institutions earning, and I use that word very carefully, earning the faith of the population at large. They got to take make the right steps for everyone to say, yeah, you know what, you're right. I actually do kind of trust you for a lot of these things. And how they get there, I'm not really sure, but that's the necessary step. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think the final point I'd like to make is just that I think from other countries, it seems much more dire than it actually is from an outsider's perspective. But just knowing what we know about the American spirit and the American ethos, I never thought there was any risk in the coup attempt being successful. And I think because Amer Americans at our core, we love freedom. We fight hard for freedom of speech. We fight hard to make things better. I am still very bullish in the future of America. I don't think there's any risk of some small extremist faction, particularly if they get their facts wrong and actually taking over power. So I think, I th really think the best days of America are ahead of us, but it's probably going to be a very different America, a more decentralized America where we're all sort of working together in cohort. And that's a fundamentally different approach than, you know, like some private company in China could never ban President Xi. So from all the talk about it being Orwellian, there is something kind of uplifting about knowing that at least, you know, private institutions have the power to make their own calls and it's not all about what the government decides to do. So I think we are sort of emerging as a more anti-fragile system, but you know, there's a lot of growing pains to get there and all members of the collective might not make it. It's like we have the main collective and then we've got some factions that are shooting off into the abyss. Yeah. And, and it's about minimizing the ability of those factions to, to 
uh, not, I mean, make noise, everyone can speak, but minimizing their ability to and damage actively, the whole. Yeah. And, and remember, I mean, there's, if you talk to most people, they just want to live a fine, normal life where they hang out with their family and friends, they eat good food, they, you know, they engage, they go bowling or whatever. I don't know. Um, I like bowling. Um, uh, candle pin too, but it's kind of bullshit. <laughs> anyway, um, candle pin's kind of bullshit. But uh, uh, most people just want to do that. And, um, and once that starts to go away, people will gravitate more towards just wanting stability mm-hmm. and normalcy. Um, and I think that that's also the need of most of the people that are have a lot of influence and power and money is that they would like a jurisdiction that has stability so that their investments are secure because no one wants to no one wants to invest in a place where they think that the government or another entity is just going to seize their property um i think things will be fine i think it's very shocking and disturbing what just happened but i think things will be okay you just gotta just just go talk to regular people. <laughs> go talk yeah. to people. People like, with different don't... opinions are not necessarily your enemy. We're all on the same team here. Yeah. And don't listen. To, you know, the news plays things up because it has an agenda to it, because it needs to play things up for so that people look at it. Yeah. Um, just go talk to people. Just go talk to people in a coffee shop or on the street. And it's hard to do that right now because of COVID. But just once you can do that freely again, just go talk to your neighbors and actually discuss these things. You're probably yeah. way closer to each other than you really believe or you know think now. Yeah, well, I think that's a great place to end it. Uh, Brett, thank you for injecting some sanity and perspective into these crazy sequence of events. I always and, try. Talk about yeah. What has and yeah, thank you to our listeners. We'll happen. see you next week. And what will inevitably happen? The past, the present, and the future. If you enjoy thinking about the future as much as we do, we invite you to join the HTF community. Simply go to hencethefuture.com, scroll to the bottom of the homepage, and add your email address next to the button that says, Enter the Void. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter, at Hence the Future. And, most importantly, we encourage you to please rate and review the show in Apple Podcasts if you haven't done so already. Our team reads and appreciates every single review. Thank you again for listening to today's episode and for staying curious, and we'll see you next week.